Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ORF uh, for this very interesting session we have today. Uh, this is a book discussion on um, a book that is already making a lot of waves in India. You, have, you must have seen Walter on, tele on your television screens um, and discussing the book, uh, The RSS, A View to the Inside. Walter is an old friend. He has been straddling the world of policy and academia quite effortlessly over the last few decades, I would say, and working uh, before uh, this new generation of uh, so-called India scholars originated in, in um, Washington. Uh, Walter uh, was holding forth, uh, I think, as a scholar, as a student, as, a, as an observer of Indian politics, in Indian foreign policy, Indian society. Uh, which I think with some very, very penetrating insight. So his first book uh, on the RSS, which was I think the very first book uh, and one of the very few works on RSS that emerged um, uh, early on, uh, he continues the tradition with his, his second book uh, with his co-author Sridhar Damli, who unfortunately could not be here with us today. Uh, but I think uh, uh, this is an important uh, intellectual achievement, I would say, as a, as a student of international, uh, as a student of Indian politics. Uh, because uh, there are hardly any good research-based works on RSS for various reasons. So he continues, to, he takes forward the scholarship on the RSS, a very important um, institution in the country uh, in various respects. Uh, you may like it, you may not dislike it, you can critique it, you can debate it. Uh, but there is no denying the fact that the impact of RSS today uh, in Indian politics, Indian society is far-reaching. And this is something that this book chronicles. It asks a few questions, interesting questions about its evolution. Uh, and it uh, uh, does this with a deep dive, with some great uh, research, some great interviews, uh, some great data mining on uh, the origins of RSS and how uh, it has come to be uh, at the center of uh, Indian politics today, or Indian society today. And so with that, uh, I would uh, welcome uh, Walter to ORF. Um, and for this, to this discussion, we have uh, two uh, very distinguished panelists with us today uh, from the left and the right. Um, Roshan and Abhinav, who will have their own uh, views and critique and uh, debate uh, about the book. But before that, let's welcome Walter. Uh, Walter, floor is all yours. Well, thank you. Uh, writing a book about the RSS is always a dangerous occupation. Um, as I have uh, discovered, not only in the three and a half years that we've done research on this book, but in the first book, in fact, in some ways, the first book was easier because no one really knew about the RSS uh, or knew much about it. And overseas, almost nobody knew anything about the RSS. Uh, and some of you re may remember India Today had a review of the book. And the, the review came out just as I was about to leave to work as an assistant to the ambassador at the embassy. And it was a very positive review. Actually, that was a great advantage that it was a positive review because I used that review in, you know, in, in the few times that uh, I would talk to people about the RSS. But given the, the very political and controversial nature of it, um, I knew that I had sort of to keep silent because among other things, I was no taker to the ambassador. We would often meet uh, RSS, uh, or sometimes meet RSS figures, more, more likely BJP figures. And in fact, you and I were note takers at a common meeting, which you may remember, that the ambassador had with Rajiv Gandhi, uh, and which uh, I still remember that meeting vividly, because Rajiv Gandhi dominated the conversation. And the ambassador went there to give him, is there anybody from the US Embassy here? <laughs> the ambassador went there to give him a lecture uh, on some things he had said uh, about US foreign policy in the Middle East. And Rajiv Gandhi turned the conversation totally around to what he was trying to do in the Indian economy, which you know that the, he figured the ambassador would see as a very favorable move. And that was it. And then we were going home, and I said to the ambassador, well, what should I write <laughs> you know, about this meeting? Oh, he said, tell them I gave him hell <laughs> about that. I'm sure you know that phenomenon as well. And I had to use my imagination <laughs> as to uh, what was said. And after that, in this, in when I, whenever I read State Department cables of conversations, I always read it with a bit of, what should I say, skepticism <laughs> about how accurate. And some of you I know are from other embassies as well. I'm sure you all have the same phenomenon in reporting uh, what was actually said. I want to thank Harsh Punt for inviting me uh, to talk about the book. Um, and 
Harsh and I have been friends uh, a long time, and we continue to correspond with each other. Um, and I want to start out with a mention of something that he alluded to in his introductory remarks, and that is mentioned the late professors Suzanne Rudolph and Lloyd Rudolphs, of whom some of you may know who the Rudolphs were. They made a significant contribution to the area of, of, uh, of comparative politics, especially as it applied to India. Uh, we dedicated the book to them. Um, they were my advisors at the University of Chicago. They were actually the ones who had introduced me to the whole notion of what was the RSS and encouraged me to do some work on the subject. And they, they mentored our first book, The Brotherhood and Saffron. Um, they unfortunately died soon after we began working on the second book. Uh, and I keep thinking in my mind, the fact they aren't here to mentor the way they did the first book, we may have some, let's just say, theoretical issues which are not as clearly put in this book as they were in the first, which owes much to their advice to us. And those of you who knew him, uh, knew them, you know, miss their presence um, uh, in the world of academia and just as people. They encouraged that, us to bring out this book because they said, you know, India has changed a lot. Uh, when you first wrote the book, as I said, almost nobody knew the RSS. Now in India, everybody knows the RSS. Now, as I said, that can be, that's a double-edged sword. It can, you know, have some um, advantageous as well as some difficult aspects to that, and that's certainly the case, and I, I know that as well, um, that that can be the case, to be kind of be objective uh, in an organization where people tend to be on two sides uh, of the aisle regarding that. But there have been enormous changes in the RSS, which I think is important to look at, and, and this book tries to address that. In fact, the Rudolphs had suggested to us as we were thinking of uh, preparing this book, they said do a case study approach, because that will give a, a kind of multifaceted view of how the RSS handles a various challenges, and that might provide a better insight into what this organization is all about. I want to thank uh, Professor Philip Oldenburg, who some of you may know, who is my classmate and roommate at the University of Chicago many years ago, who read the whole book um, and provided advice, both theoretical as well as factual advice. And I want to also thank my son, Eric, who read the whole book. Uh, he's, among other things, he's my harshest critic as to whether or not it was understandable or not to a person who is not, you know, expert on India, though he's come here many times, um, and not an expert on comparative politics as well. Finally, I want to thank the co-author, Sridhar Damle, who is a walking encyclopedia of all things regarding the RSS. We co-authored the first book. It was a commercial, and I think success in terms of uh, uh, the theoretical approach it, it took. And so we decided to do the current one, and we hope that the book is as successful as that one was. I should give a, a sort of a, a cheer for it because you can get a copy of the book here and I'm willing to stay around and sign any copies that you may buy for the book. And I'm un, someone told me you can get it on Kindle. I guess I shouldn't say this, but you know, it's 300 rupees cheaper on Kindle than it is the actual hard copy. So you can, you can get it on Kindle, which I didn't know until he showed me that it's possible. Okay, the RSS is very different from what it was 30 years ago in several respects. Um, and there's often a uh, misconception that it is homogenous, and one purpose of the case study is to show different opinions and debates within the RSS and how to handle issue, and I'll go into one, briefly go into one such to underscore that point. Uh, and the other that it's static, it doesn't change. Well, it does change, um, and considerably in many ways. So what are those changes and what are the significance of them? Um, perhaps the most obvious difference is that the RSS and the family of organizations around it have expanded enormously uh, from the time that the last book came out. And, and we have statistical data that shows that the expansion really coincides very much with the economic reforms in India in the early 1990s. And if you look at a graph of RSS membership and those of its various affiliates, the graph is like that, with the incline steepest in uh, the 1990s and the, in the first decade 
of this century. Now, the other interesting thing besides the just expansion is that where the expansion has taken place, uh, much of it is in the south and the northeast of India. In fact, an interesting statistic about the location of Shakas, which are the local branches of the RSS, they have more in Kerala than in Maharashtra. Yes, uh, which means that the presence, the strong presence of the RSS does not necessarily mean a strong presence of the BJP, because the BJP has not done all that well in Kerala, though it's improved, but it doesn't, hasn't done all that well. Whereas it's done quite well uh, in Maharashtra, where there are fewer shakas than there are in the state of Kerala. But the most interesting part of the growth, in my view, and is what the book spends a lot of time talking about, is the expansion of the various affiliates of the RSS. When we first did the book, there were affiliates, but they were relatively small and few in number. They are now about 44 full-time affiliates and about 60 or 70 more which are in one stage or the other of becoming affiliates. And they're in all sorts of areas, um, from empowerment of women, you have India's largest labor union group, the Bharatiya Mazda Sangh, which is an affiliate. India's ruling party is an affiliate. You have one of the larger of the farm associations, Bharatiya uh, Kisan Sangh is affiliate. And you just go on and on and on. There's a friend of mine who had grown up in a communist household in Mumbai in the middle 1940s and said at one time you had this phenomenon among the communists. They had groups in all parts of society. That's by and large collapsed. And the one large um, organization that has a similar situation today is the Sung family. And I've often been wondered why that's the case. I don't have a good explanation. If there's anyone here who can give me a good explanation as to why this has happened, I'd be actually interested to know. We ad address the issue, but only briefly in the book, mainly because neither one of us, neither my co-author or myself, could come up with a good argument that fit any kind of theoretical perspective as to how that happened. If you have some ideas about that, that would be, I'd, I'd appreciate that because we are told that there'll be another printing of the book. We can make changes, and I, I look forward to comments that those of you who have who've written the, have read the book and who might have ideas on the RSS and BJP, because we can make some changes. We've already discovered some mistakes that we've made. Um, and so if you either point out the mistakes or how we can look at it, and this is one question we want to look at, is, is why it has been so successful in expanding into various parts uh, of Indian society in ways that no other group has done, and certainly not the communists, with, which used to have you know, this kind of penetration, but doesn't anymore, and why that's the case. Um, second change is that the, uh, the, the RSS family has become much more diverse. And part of that's because of the expansion into various areas where you have diverse interests. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but perhaps one of the major areas where there is internal disagreement, and that's on the issue of foreign direct investment. And I'll talk about that in, in a few minutes, but there are some others as well where there are internal differences within the RSS, in part because it now appeals to uh, different social groups and a much more diverse um, uh, membership than it had, certainly when we were looking at it. When we were looking at it, the, the membership was overwhelmingly high caste Hindu, uh, with a high percentage, if not a large majority, of the leadership being Brahmin. That's no longer the case. There's probably, a, well, there is a strong Brahmin element, but it is, from what the perspective that we have, it's diminishing. Now, it's a hard uh, fact for a scholar to get uh, their handle on because the RSS did not keep close membership statistics and certainly not on caste, they don't. So one has to rely on kind of anecdotal evidence. But as one RSS person told me, look at who the prime minister is. He's an OBC. And look, uh, take a cl close look at the candidates that the BJP has. There, you know, there are an increasing number of people from outside that formerly Brahmin Banya uh, ne nexus that, you know, that had once really controlled the BJP. I get less uh, accurate information when I say, well, what about the RSS itself? 
can you tell me, and normally I get uh, kind of vague answers, as we don't keep statistics, you know, we're above that sort of thing, and uh, go on and on about that. So I'm, I, I can't say as accurately for the RSS itself, though it is my sort of anecdotal evidence that the RSS has also become much more diverse itself. And so I, there was a press interview I had that got a lot of comment. I had said it's only a matter of time before you have an OBC or a Dalit who is the Sarsang Chalik, the head of the RSS. I'd be, oh, it's never going to happen. I don't think that's true. I think it may well happen sooner than we expect. Um, and I think partly it's because, and I go into this book, why the RSS has felt under compulsion to expand its membership and who you know, are in leadership positions. Okay, a third change that's taken place over the last three decades in the RSS that I think is, is, is important is the pervas pervasive impact of the government on the RSS affiliates and therefore on the RSS itself. <laughs> And the RSS, when we did the original research, had only a passing reference to policy questions. Uh, today, they're very intimately informed about policy questions. Um, and there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is that the various affiliates have an interest in policy questions and the pervasive impact of the Indian government on all parts of life uh, in this country. For example, the Bharatiya Kisan Sang, the farmer, um, uh, affiliate of the RSS, is interested in farm support prices, the cost of inputs, electricity, water, fertilizers, and even the curriculum content in rural schools. And therefore, the RSS is interested. We have a whole shelf of books, in fact, from the Bharatiya Kisan addressing these various issues, and some in the RSS addressing these various issues. If you look at the annual statement of the head of the RSS, the, uh, the Vijay Dashmi statement, which is about a new one is about to come out. You can see that it's addressing, it's kind, of, it's kind of like the State of the Union address of the RSS. It's now addressing specifically, specific policy questions in ways that, you know, several years ago that wasn't the case. These addresses were often vague, feel good, very amorphous, Kind of statements. Now they're actually quite specific. There's a kind of um, Hindutva populism uh, that's part of it. We can talk a little bit about that when, when we get to it. As I say, a new one is about to come out. Um, I'm told you're going to have uh, much the same kind of content in the new one as you had in the last one um, last October when it came out. Now, the incorporation of different interests in the Sung family is the fourth change that's, had, that's happened over the last three decades. Um, and as a consequence of that, the RSS is now engaging in something far beyond the character building, which had been its core of operations in the, ver in the various shakas. It's still important in the various shakas, but it, it's got beyond that. It's become something of a lobby group for its various affiliates, but more, important, more importantly, it has uh, assumed the role of a kind of judge uh, to mediate disputes among the various affiliates. I'll give you one example. In fact, I'll go into a later example, which is more important on the FDI, but land and labor legislation. There's been problems of land and labor legislation getting through parliament in part only because of opposition of the opposition. I'm told by very senior people in both the BJP and the RSS, the real problem is because of opposition within the Sung Parivar. The Bhartiya Mazdur Sung is against land reforms that have been proposed, eminent domain, to make it easier to acquire land, to expand business. Labor legislation, there's some difficulties in getting labor legislation passed in part because of strong opposition from the, both the Bharatiya Mazdur Sangh and the Bharatiya Kisan Sangh and a, and a range of other groups within the BJP. And so they, they, it, in typical BJP fashion, the issue was put on the shelf uh, and um, until they could sort of come back to it at some point. But in these two cases, what they did is because of a provision in the Indian Constitution that allows states to take up issues that the center uh, can't handle or won't handle, 
the the BJP has sort of has taken that route, and there are a couple of states who have adopted land and labor legislation, but not at the center. And I it's and I think it's wrong to say it's because of the opposition that's partly the factor in this, but it's mainly because of internal problems. In terms of the BJP operating procedure of arriving at a consensus, if they can't put it do it uh, put it on on the back burner. You have a copy of the book. I'll show you. It's kind of funny. See the copy of the book here? You notice the pants of these guys? These are long pants. <laughs> now, why is that interesting? In 2010, the issue of having long pants or short pants came up before the RSS Central Committee, and they couldn't reach a decision. So it was decided in five years, we're going to come back to this issue on long pants or short pants. And they then decided that it could change to long pants from short pants. It was, I was told it was a heated debate because, let's face it, most organizations, traditions of one kind or another, are hard to change. And this was one tradition. The original cover did not have this. The original cover had short pants. I said, no, you have to have, to have long pants in it. And Penguin agreed to do it. This is also being published in London by Hearst. Hearst is not changing it. Their cover is exactly the same except it has short pants. Why won't they have long pants? Because they said in, in the mind's eye of many people outside of India, maybe even inside India, who follow the RSS, is short pants. So we're keeping the short pants. So if you buy a, uh, the Hearst edition of the book, it's slightly different from this edition of the book. And that is, uh, that is an example of the RSS decision making, is to arrive at a consensus, if you can do so. And if you can't, then you put it on the shelf. Or do some kind of compromise, as was, uh, was done in the, the land and labor issue. Now, with all of this, these differences, how has it stayed together? In fact, this was an issue for those of you who came to the book launch on August the 2nd. This was an issue, there was kind of a debate between Rajade, Rajdeep Sardesai and, uh, and Ram Madhav interesting combination of people to talk about this, uh, is how has this multi-headed thing stayed together? And I think it has to do with a few elements of the RSS that have not changed. I've just gave, given you some examples where there have been changes. But a few elements have not changed. And one of them is the fact that all the affiliates, including the RSS itself, have at its administrative top full-time RSS workers who are referred to as Pracharics. And the, the number varies. This is one of uh, the kind of the got you elements of the book. Some are like, oh, it's not 6,000 as we say in the book. It's actually four to 5,000. Um, and some have said it's 3,000. It, it, in fact, it depends on how you define what is a full-time worker. But whatever, let's say it's full-time workers. There's several thousand of them. They have a, a very vigorous training process, uh, which we describe in the book, both this one and the earlier book as well. And they are assigned to the various affiliates. And it's our experience that they tend to identify with the interests of the affiliates because they tend to spend their whole professional life with that affiliate. So if you're assigned to the Bharatiya Mazda Sangh, you'll stay with it, probably for the rest of your life in the Bharatiya Mazda Sangh. And one of the consequences, you'll begin to identify with the interests of the Bharatiya Mazda Sangh. If you're um, uh, assigned to the political party, the BJP, you, you will probably begin to identify with the interests of, of the party. In fact, I know that because I've met Pracharaks in the party and Pracharaks in the BMS and, and on a whole variety of issues, they have different views, uh, in part because of the, of the group to which they're affiliated. And I'll go into one, one example of that. They've often referred to uh, these full-time workers as ascetic casteless Hindu monks. Well, they're not technically monks, but they, there is an ascetic quality. Most of them are not ex are expected to be unmarried. Uh, they get their income from the outside. Um, but there aren't enough of them, and so what's happened to the various organizations is they're beginning to train their own full-time workers outside this Pracharic network, um, in part because there are technical issues that are coming up that require people with special skills to go into them. And uh, uh, from what I'm told, overwhelmingly, they tend to be retired people you know, who want to continue working in some way, and they get paid to do this, whereas the RSS Pracharic is not paid to do what, what they do. 
Okay, the second unchanging element beside you know, this Pacharic system in all of the various groups is the, the training in the local shakas. Uh, and in both books, we interviewed hundreds of ordinary RSS members and in various of the affiliates. And something that kept coming through was while there may be differences on policy, the unity of the larger family is important for nation building. And I'm struck by even people who had different ideas, very different ideas on politics and on other issues. At the, at, at, you know, at the end of the day, when it came to sort of analyzing this, these organizations felt that unity was important. And one of the things in the West, when people look at the RSS, and I think to a certain extent here in India as well, is how has this whole thing stayed together? Um, and my co-author and I had a long debate. So we ultimately came to these two issues here that we just mentioned. There are some other ideas, and I'd be interested if any of you have ideas as to how this thing has stayed together, and what do you think, whether you think it's going to stay together or not. Okay, um, how much time do I have? 10 more minutes, Ten more minutes. okay. Um, the book is basically a set of nine case studies um, to, to shine the light on various aspects of, of the RSS. And we tried to use the theoretical background of Graham Allison and the Cuban Missile Crisis, where he does a similar sort of thing of looking at the issue from a number of perspectives in the bureaucracy. And we did something very similar as well. You know, a central thesis of Graham Allison is that you are where you sit in the bureaucracy. Having been in the bureaucracy myself for a long time, and you have as well, I think there's a lot of truth to that. You know, your views change depending on what your specific responsibilities are in the bureaucracy. And so to sort of put, you know, to sort of, you know, compare that to the, you know, the RSS and its various affiliates, you begin to affiliate or identify with the group that you're working with in, in the organization. So uh, anyway, um, the, the nine case studies are, uh, the two case studies analyze the RSS view toward Muslims as people and Islam as a religion. And it, they, they're the first two. Two focus on economic issues, uh, FDI, and India's economic relations with China. Three relate to the RSS maneuvering between the sacred and the profane, cow protection, the Ram Temple at Ayodhya, and conversion. And the final two address issues of political process. Uh, one analyze, analyzes a very interesting crisis in the Goa RSS, when there was actually a rebellion in the Goa RSS regarding a BJP government's language policy in Roman Catholic schools, English, giving grants of aid in English, which a large part of the RSS in Goa felt was a violation of the RSS's policy of all education should be in the mother tongue of a region. So uh, I won't tell you what the conclusion is. Read, read the chapter. I think it's one of the more interesting chapters as, as to how the RSS handled this issue. And the second analyzes the RSS help to the BJP campaign in the 2015 Bihar Assembly election. Now, I want to sort of look at one of the issues, and that's F, uh, foreign direct investment to show the uh, tussle that goes on in the uh, RSS and in the family over a particular issue, an important issue like FDI. The RSS, for most of its history, has attacked foreign direct investment as a dangerous uh, policy to have. Um, and it only began to change, and this view only began to change about 2010, 11, 12, and it was represented in a speech that Mohan Bhagwat, the current head of the RSS, gave when he said that the RSS, this is a quote, the RSS was not, is not bound by dogma. In other words, we're, uh, we're willing to be much more flexible in how we approach the issue of foreign direct investment. In 2016, Prime Minister Modi declared that India had become, and to quote him again, the most open economy in the world for FDI. 
Two years later at, Davo, at, at the Davos meeting, he identified the, his government with globalization and opposed trade protectionism. In fact, some people have said that he maybe deliberately tried to show that he was as much in favor of, uh, of globalization as the man who had spoken the year before, Xi Jinping, who made a big, China is all for a globalized world and limited limitations on, on FDI, uh, on, on trade. Last year, as many of you know, India was the world's largest recipient of FDI. And the government praised the fact that this was the case. But not all parts of the RSS family was as enthusiastic as the government was about this figure. Some are vehemently opposed to FDI. The Swadeshi Jagran Munch has made reducing FDI a basic element of its mission in, uh, in what it does. It argues that what FDI does, it, it, uh, it, it introduces alien values of consumerism. And I'm talking from, uh, from a pamphlet that they had issued on this. It cedes economic sovereignty to multinationals. It leads to further poverty. And it widens the already wide gap between rich and poor. And I'll have to sort of give you a little anecdote on that. Uh, one of the newspapers today had an article, was it yesterday, on, on uh, the Gini coefficient. And, uh, and arguing that it's become really quite high in India. It's almost approaching the level of China in India. And this, call, this person I know, who's from the uh, Swadeshi Jagran Munch, sent me an email. See, see, this is what happens when you uh, permit extensive FDI to come into the country, is you're going to have a, a situation where it, uh, the Gini coefficient for India gets worse. Now, whether or not that's true or not, maybe it's just, you know, uh, 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 you know, a circumstance or not, I don't know, but it seems to sort of to back up what they want. The Bharatiya Mazdur Sangh, the labor front uh, of the RSS, has even taken issue of FDI to the streets, as some of you know who follow this issue. The Modi government, for its part, sees FDI as an important element in economic uh, growth and in job creation. And with elections looming in a year's time, Job creation is all important for the government, even though many in the RSS family look at the way that job creation is being done as illegitimate. And it's an interesting debate to see internally how this issue is going to work its way out. And in fact, you, you see this kind of dilemma in almost all the case studies that I have mentioned, we have mentioned in the book. So how has the RSS reacted to this division of opinion? Mohan Bhagwat, in a very famous speech he gave in April 2018 in Mumbai to the business community, suggested that the RSS had a role of balancing interests of the various affiliates. And he argued that the RSS is not wedded to any single ism. And he would judge, he says, any economic policy on whether it benefits the poor and does not lead to a greater division of income between the rich and the poor. It's an interesting, you know, I think the, the RSS, you know, is, is going to make an interesting play because there's a kind of Hindutva populism on economics as to how it will react uh, to the government's obvious desire to um, improve investment and much of it coming through FDI. I don't know the recent figures on FDI, whether they sort of match last year's figure, but uh, I'm told by someone that in fact, that they, they, they do in fact uh, match it. Now, the RSS faces as it looks to the future three, in my view, three huge problems and how it reacts to these issues, I think will both affect its usefulness and whether or not it goes the way of the communists in the 1940s. Uh, and declines as an institution that has effect in the various parts of society. One of them is the persistence of caste and caste hi hierarchies in India. And the caste undermines the long-term RSS goal of social unity. In fact, the very purpose of its being is to bring about social unity. But one can argue it's not been especially successful at that. And, um, it might, that would involve it taking sort of revolutionary steps. That's not the RSS mode of operation. It's been, you know, historically an evolutionary group 
that has been cautious as to how it's moved forward on any issue. But this is one it, it, that uh, Ashish Nandi has said, you know, it, it's the issue of, of Hindutva versus Hinduism. And he predicts, for those of you who've read Ashish, he predicts that this is going to be a clash of some significance, not maybe not now, but as you look forward, it will it will be. But it certainly is an, is a it, it's a division of views, uh, of philosophic views of the RSS against what many people think is the binding element of Hinduism, which is its caste system. Um, then the second issue I think it has to face is the emergence or the uh, the sense of entitlement or uh, the empowerment of the far right in terms of violence on various issues of piety, beef, the temple, conversion. Now, the RSS leadership and the BJP and other groups say that it's embarrassing to the group to have these examples. And normally they argue that law and order is the way to handle it. And in fact, the prime minister in his speech also more or less you know, stuck to that argument. I don't think it's enough. You need something more than law and order to handle a situation like this. Um, the state of, of Goa has introduced an interesting idea. It's a BJP government. It's created a commission which, whose responsibilities basically are in two baskets. One is intelligence, gathering intelligence on what's happening in the state, particularly as it relates to violence and vigilante activities. And the other was is security, is to have a security force which can either prevent or, or contain the issue. And this more or less follows what India's own Supreme Court has advised all the states to do. I would have liked it uh, if that had gotten into the speech on August the 15th, but I, I kept, you know, he kept talking. I said, okay, what's next? What's next? Uh, but it never came next um, in, in the speech. And I think it would be useful. He could have pointed to this, uh, the issue of Goa itself, which is the BJP government, taking a step that would, I think, be in the right direction. The third is how to identify uh, or address the differences between uh, rural India and urban India. And there, here again, the recent statistics have shown that the, G that the difference in income of these two areas is growing, and they have different interests. And one of the differing interests that we talk about in the book is education. There's a, there's a very different perspective in rural India on what kind of education to have than in urban India on what kind of education to have. And I'm told that either this week or last week that all over the country uh, uh, there, there are meetings are being held um, by education ministries as to how to shape education. And this is one of the issues that are being addressed in these meetings. I'm also told that it's being addressed not too seriously because there are lots of various interests involved in making any significant change in the educational process. But I think it's going to have to be addressed at some point. 30% of the Indian people live in urban areas. That's increasing. But the large majority still live in rural areas. And something I think has to be done in some significant way to address what is a uh, a, a growing, it could be a growing crisis, especially in rural India, over uh, where the country is going to go in the future. Okay, I'd, I'd appreciate any comments you have, particularly any critical comments, uh, but not too critical. And um, and you know, any ideas about uh, when we uh, redo the book or make changes in the book, which hopefully we'll we, we'll be able to do, because I'm told the sales have so far been quite good. And if you haven't bought a copy, you can get one right outside. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much. Um, before I give the floor to, to, to the two discussants, can I raise one point, and if you can address that, uh, because uh, you know, apart from other things, this panel is also a bit of a gender imbalance in the, on the panel. Uh, what, you know, th there is a general perception about RSS being a very patriarchal organization. What has, uh, what has happened in that? Because you raised a number of other issues in terms of uh, marginalization and, um, and other minorities. What about the role of women in, in, in RSS and how has that evolved over the last few decades? Like, as you know, the RSS does not have women. Uh, in, in it. Uh, it was proposed in the mid-1930s um, that it accept women. And the decision was made not to because it, it involves a, a kind of, you know, training, physical training, 
as part of it. And it was felt that um, uh, socially in India, it would not be acceptable for women to participate in, uh, in that kind of situation. Now, uh, so, the, uh, so what happened was a separate women's group was formed. This is the first affiliate of the RSS. And its format and the way it operates is much like the RSS in terms of its, what happens within it. Overseas RSS, the HSS, the, the uh, um, uh, 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 most of the overseas RSS organizations have women. And certainly those in the US, the UK, Canada, and, um, and the English speaking countries. And there's a reason for that is because the, uh, the RSS membership in those countries tend to be middle class, upper middle class, well educated, and have accepted the legitimacy of having women participate. And I've been to many of the, these meetings and you have you know, young girls, women, um, who are participating in, in the various activities. Now you have in India, you know, beside the Shaka as the basic unit, which is unisex, it's men. Uh, if it's the RSS or it's women, if it's its counterpart organization. You do have weekly and monthly meetings of the RSS that are actually tailored to uh, the growing membership of the RSS, which is from a middle class professional background. And there you do have women who uh, are involved in many of them. All of the affiliates involve women. Um, none of them have ever excluded women, not even the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, which is often looked at as the more conservative of them. If you look at the two women who were the most vehement, or the two people who were the most vehement in the various temple marches, who were they? Oma Bharti, yes, and the other one? Uh, right, and could you imagine them as retiring? You know, no, you know, they, they were <clears throat> out there, you know, fighting it up, and they, they were hardly the kind of retiring person that Go Walker, as head of the RSS, wrote about in his book, Bunch of Thoughts. He saw the ideal woman as the mother, um, as uh, uh, the mate of her husband. These two women hardly fit in that category. I'm not sure if either one are married, in fact. Uh, but, you know, they are independent, tough ladies. One of the RSS festivals, in fact, points to that. They have six fest they have festival years, six and eight. One of them is on the Rani of Jhansi. And the way that she is often portrayed is a tough lady who stood up for a patriotic India, uh, often uh, portrayed, I'm, sure I'm not sure if it's uh, intellectually accurate, because her husband was something of a wimp. And I'm not sure if that's in fact the case, but that's often the way it's portrayed, that here is this tough lady who when a crisis developed, she came to the rescue. Well, this is hardly the kind of retiring you know, lady that one often thinks the RSS, and I think is somewhat behind your question as well. Uh, so you know, th there is a role for women. Who are the two, in some senses, two of the more capable cabinet members in two of the most important cabinet ministries? Who are they? They're foreign affairs and defense. Both are headed by women. I am told both are really tough ladies. Uh, that, you know, uh, they are very demanding. People have told me who have had to work with them. I'm sure you've had to work with at least some of them know them. You, you may have a separate idea. But anyway, I've been told that, that they're very tough ladies who, you know, who have, you know, who, you know, are not the retiring kind of ladies one thinks of as, as you know, many people think of it in terms of the role of the women. Will women ever become members of the RSS and participants in the Shaka, which is sort of the core um, uh, membership uh, of the RSS? Not any time soon, I don't think. I don't think that culturally India would accept, I could be wrong, you know, women participating in a kind of martial arts with men in a, a setting like that. I could be wrong. You know, maybe the country is developing certain certain areas. It's developing where it could it would be accepted or not. You know, in the US, you know, the Boy Scouts has only recently begun to accept women. Here is in the US, and they fought it tooth and nail almost to the very end about, about I mean, you probably followed that issue of, of, of Boy Scouts and, and, and girls coming into, into the uh, Boy Scouts. Uh, where I live in Northern Virginia, um, a very middle class area, 
the local Boy Scouts run by the Episcopal Church, because Boy Scouts in the U.S. tend to be run by churches, fought that issue. And then finally, the neighbors sort of resist, said, you know, you better do something about that or we're going to sort of make a protest at the church. And of course, the local priest said, oh my God, I can't have that happen. So they actually began to change. So I don't know, you know, uh, how the change would come in India, but I don't, I don't see it coming anytime soon. Thank you, Walter. Uh, let me move to uh, Roshan. Uh, Roshan Kishore is the first discussant. Um, he's a political economy editor at Hindustan Times. Walter. Uh, sorry, Roshan, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Professor Pant, for uh, inviting me to share my views on something which is an extremely germane topic for all of us in India and allowing me to share the stage with somebody who is as eminent an academic as Professor Anderson. Uh, let me state at the outset that whatever I say here, are, my personal views are not to be attributed to my newspaper. And like a good journalist, I have brought my copy and I sort of look at it while I speak. So, well, I'm a journalist now, but I also, and uh, Professor Pan would you prompt me when I finish my 10 minutes, I have 15 minutes, right? Uh, I've also had a history of left student activism in uh, Jawala Nehru University. And a lot of what I speak, I've read Professor Anderson's book. He's given a very useful and concise summary of it. So my reading of his book and my general impression about the politics around the RSS. And the central argument which I'm trying to make is, why is this book extremely important for people who actually do not agree with the RSS? That is what I'll try and argue out here. Now, first, let me say that had Professor Anderson not been a an author of this book, this book would probably, I believe, have not got as much traction as it's getting today. And when I say this, I do not mean that, you know, Harvard is always better than hard work. But I think Professor Anderson has that critical distance vis-a-vis -vis the RSS. The Indian debate on the RSS is so polarized that any book on the RSS is bound to be branded as a pro-RSS or an anti-RSS book. And there has been name calling going on around this book also, but I don't think it is the point. Now, why do I think, you know, we should all read this book? now? I'll quote something which Sun Tzu said, and you know, in the days before Google, we were actually told that Mao said this, not Sun Tzu. So, it, you know, it is said that if you know your enemies and you know yourself, you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. If you do not know your enemies, but you know yourself, you'll win one and you'll lose one. If you do not know your enemies, nor yourself, you will be imperiled in every single battle. I think the anti-RSS camp in India, which is you know, the left of center political spectrum, the entire thing, we do not understand the beast the RSS has become today. We are still entrenched in our old notions about the RSS. And it is here that the book adds to the understanding of the concerned. And when I say concerned, I've highlighted it in my notes, which is the important sort of way attached to the concerned thing. Now, the first lesson which I think I've seen uh, what has been happening on the ground in Indian politics, and also the book also has to sort of does not say it explicitly, but it gives us an idea about it, is that the RSS does not need an intellectual justification from us. This applies both to the political realm and the RSS's own intellectual realm. It's, <clears throat> to put it crudely, it's a major majoritarian religious organization. It's an organization claiming to be representing Hindus who are a majority in our country. And it draws its own traction from entrenched dogma, values, whatever we might choose to call them, among the majority community. The best examples are what is happening in Kashmir and JNU. Now, intellectually, it is very, you know, and both in Kashmir and JNU, the RSS view is actually not a majority view. You know, in JNU also, the majority is against that view, and in Kashmir also we are witnessing. But that has not stopped the RSS or, you know, its political affiliates, especially the BJP, from gaining politically around those issues. And that is where the, you know, RSS is so efficient. Even an intellectual defeat for the RSS actually turns into a political victory for it. And to say this is not to justify the RSS, but you have to recognize that this, this is a fact of life. You have to take it as it is. The second lesson is that we cannot ignore how the RSS has evolved in its own history. The book gives a lot of detail from you know, the founder of the RSS to that famous Pasan Jakyan Mala speech given by Balasav Dauras, social equality, all these things, how the RSS has done this. And you no, know, it is not just that. For example, you know, Professor Anderson said about the role of economic reforms. Now, the book gives a lot of detail about how the RSS is actually working among the Indian diaspora, especially in countries like US, Western Europe, and all that. And a lot of you know, success of the programs Prime Minister Modi has been holding in those countries is actually thanks to the organizational work and effort which has been put in by the RSS. Now, let me pose in a question here. You know, we all know, would this kind of a support traction for the RSS have been possible had the IT revolution not happened in this country? 
Now we know pre you know IT revolution, Indians which actually migrated to the United States, not all of them, but an overwhelming majority of them were extremely elite. They would go do their PhDs in universities, social sciences, all that stuff. And they came from very, you know, quote unquote, left liberal backgrounds. Now, this is not to say that I am demeaning the IT, you know, uh, uh, professional crowd in the US which is there and who are representing India have brought a lot of goods for our country. But they, we should also accept that they are an extremely diverse and non-elite crowd compared to what the U Indian diaspora used to be in this country earlier. And, you know, I always personally think that Professor Suhas Palchika's arguments on these things are very important. You know, he says that, you know, the way we see the idea of India, you know, how the secular republic, uh, you know, sort of notion came into order that there was an elite consensus around Pandit Nehru uh, when he became the Prime Minister, which actually you know, was forged more by the intellectual and political sort of command Nehru had rather than a bottom-up consensus around it. So Professor Palshikar has you know, argued it in very details and there's this recent article he has written in the EPW where he actually argues that even a political defeat for the BJP in the next elections, it need not you know, uh, put an end to the hegemony of the, the political hegemony which the BJP sort of stands for today. And this is something I think is extremely important for us to understand. Now, similarly, a lot, similarly, a lot of attack on the RSS today is, you know, what Guru Golwalkar said about this, the RSS was not a participant in the freedom movement and all those things are said about the RSS, when, you know, politically people sort of try and, you know, counter the RSS. Now, irrespective of whether those statements are true or false, and I believe that a lot of them are actually true, they do not cut, cut much ice when it comes to countering the RSS today. Because the RSS has moved on. So it's the same as saying that, you know, if the BJP were to go and start saying in Kerala today that Stalin was a bad man, hence you should not vote for the CPIM, it is not going to do any damage to the CPIM. The CPIM there is a party which has its own mass base, it handles its own contradictions. So we should see the RSS in similar light as well. You know, today the RSS stands for completely different things which it stood for probably, you know, before independence or even if it's you know, formative years you know, after the country got independent. And not, of all, not all of it has been voluntary. Professor Anderson says that, you know, the kind of bans which were imposed on the RSS after Mahatma Gandhi's assassination and other things, especially in the period during UPA 2, when the RSS for the first time realized that it might actually get persecuted for something like Hindu terror. It made sure that the BJP got political power and whatever its differences with the BJP are or will be, I think Professor Anderson makes a very strong point that the BJP remaining in government today is also a question of survival for the RSS. It will make sure that that happens. So it, it, it was a very important player in sort of RSS taking a conscious decision to participate in election campaigning for the BJP. Today, the RSS is successfully, you know, it's proliferating into hitherto unimagined areas. We probably have, I think, have no idea, you know, the kind of influence the RSS has built and it has exploited the you know, support it has got from the state machinery under the Modi government to do that. I mean, from the president to governors to universities everywhere. I believe they are you know, making inroads in the private sector as well. So this is an extremely important thing. And on this, you know, I personally believe that RSS is not something which we can politically counter. Now, if you want to counter the RSS, you have to build something like the RSS, which will stay no matter what happens in elections. Now, this is something not for us to decide, but political parties to decide. You know, can they bury their own contradictions and things like that? Now, all of you know, this which I said, does it mean that the RSS has become invincible today? Or does it mean that there are absolutely no contradictions? Now, Professor Anderson himself points out that there are a lot of contradictions which exist even today. As we go ahead into future, these contradictions would probably multiply. I completely agree with the things he's listed. I want to add a couple of more points to it. Now, I personally believe as somebody who's you know, been, who spent some time of my life as an activist and who also, you know, I think I'm a student of Politics, more a student of politics now than economics, which I've been formally trained in. I think that politics and political movements, they have their objective factors and they have their subjective factors. Now, objective factors are important in politics, but I think the importance of subjective factors cannot be diminished. They're extremely important. And the political project of the RSS, you know, less so the BJP, I think it draws its main strength from the subjective belief that the Indian state was hegemonized, colonized, whatever we might decide to call it, by non-Hindu hegemony for the last 2,000 years, which is how, you know, actually the RSS BJP refers to it, you know, 2,000 saal ki gulami ke baad, pahle baad desh mein Hindu jo hai samrat aya hai, you know. And they think that it is this history which is responsible for all predicaments which face our country today. This is the central RSS narrative, I think, the subjective factor if we were to underline it. And this is what the BJP, you know, actually tries and champions when it says, you know, Amit Shah, Narendra Modi, all of them say that the India 
under the leadership of Narendra Modi, BJP, Amit Shah, will actually reclaim its Vishwaguru status. I think this is the main subjective strength of the RSS argument. Now, this narrative, I believe, will increasingly come into question as the BJP sort of increases its political dominance in this country. Because people will actually see that we have a you know, re return of the Hindu Raj, so to say, but the problems of this country are not going anywhere. You know, because all of us know that most problems of our country, you know, from social problems like caste and patriarchy to economic problems, now you know, climate change will sort of knock on the door sooner than later. All these problems have very different structural and systemic roots than what the RSS believes it is. And you know, people who are sympathetic to the BJP, Abhinav you know, has this very favorite phrase called the idea of India gang. So the BJP you know, has a critique that the idea of India gang doesn't have all the solutions to our problems. But I also believe that the RSS is least likely to have solutions to these problems. So this is one arena where I think the subjective factor, the, the strength of the subjective factor which sort of helps propagate the RSS politics in this country will be tested in the days to come. And then the contradictions will sort of multiply into various realms as well. For example, you know, when I was associated with left activism, I was in student politics. The government has done something, you know, they've given autonomy to higher educational institutions in this country, which will supposedly help us, you know, realize world class standards and whatnot. One of the concrete manifestations of this is going to be institutions have to realize their own funds, which essentially means there has to be a fee hike. I mean, there's absolutely no way an institution can do it. It'll probably also mean a dilution of reservations, because if you grant autonomy to an institution, we do not know. It'll probably go to the courts and something will happen, but these things cannot be ruled out for the moment. Now, how is the ABVP going to react to these things? You know, it is... Two years, three years, it is easier to justify, you know, that, you know, this is all for nation building and all that. But these are concrete changes we are talking about in a country, you know, like India, where most people cannot afford, you know, these new universities have come up in Sonipat, Ashoka University, OP Jindal University. And, you know, one has to admit that they offer extremely quality education. But I'm also told, you know, told that for a one year BA program, you pay around 10 lakh rupees in fees. And there are not many people in this country who can pay that kind of fees. How are the RSS's mass organizations going to take this? And I'm not even talking about, you know, the Kisans who are against, you know, amendments to the Land Acquisition Act or the, you know, esoteric worker who is in the Bharatiya Mazdur Sang talking about FDI. This is the middle class, which I believe is an extremely important constituency for the RSS. And this is what gives RSS the legitimacy, the sort of, you know, edge in battle of ideas, which is taking place in the day-to-day -day thing, TV channels everywhere. How will the RSS sort of change to that? Or are we willing to sort of accept that, you know, you know, the entire RSS rank and file will buy into these kind of arguments that self-financing of education is the best thing to go about. Now, similarly, you know, one part where Professor Anderson dwells in a lot of detail is how Narendra Modi helped change, you know, RSS's larger projects image into something, you know, from pure Hindutva to a development-oriented Hindutva. It was a big game changer. Now, all of us know that it played a big role in the 2014 campaign. Now, I think even that is not sustainable. Now, is it just a coincidence that the RSS, you know, in so long a history could only find a leader like Narendra Modi who could also, you know, simultaneously champion Hindutva and economic development? He came from the state of Gujarat. Now, we know that, you know, Gujarat and the western coast of the country, and they have had higher levels of economic opulence and development historically. So even if the Gujarat model existed, I mean, then the, I mean, there was an overall economic boom in the country and Gujarat did better than the rest of the country. I don't think all of it can be attributed to Narendra Modi. There were other structural factors which sort of contributed to it. So, you know, once this euphoria sort of dies down, even this development thing is going to be difficult to champion. Now, similarly is the case with the anti-minority violence. Now, I personally believe that both sides of the arguments are true. I mean, the RSS machinery definitely has a role in sort of propagating and promoting this kind of violence. But I also think that all of what is happening is not under their control. I mean, it would be sort of wrong to say that everything which is happening is you know, something in RSS's control. I don't think any organization can afford to do that. If you propagate a certain set of ideas in the society, then they gain their own momentum. And that is what is currently happening right now. Everybody is getting carried away by these things. Now, this is bound to create contradictions with the current big business BJP hegemony that is there in our country. You know, everybody, it is established in social science economic research that if this sort of a social unrest sort of starts propagating, it is inimical to economic growth and development in the country. And more than that, you know, if, if lynch mobs go around rampaging things, then sooner or later a supermarket or something here or there is going to be you know, sort of broken and vandalized. And these things will have their own contradictions. Now, similarly, we 
know that today's BJP, one of the things which you know has happened in the leadership of Narendra Modi and Amit Shah is that the funding into the BJP has become extremely centralized. All money, most of it we think is big money, the ADR data which has recently come, it shows that you know, the BJP has always had an edge vis-a-vis -vis the Congress in terms of you know, corporate donations, but I mean now it has increased many fold. This entire election bond thing, you know, which sort of grants and autonomy to corporate donors, all these things are going to increase the share of corporate funding in the BJP to a very large extent. Now, this also, I believe, is going to create its own contradictions with the RSS. We know the way in which politics operates in India. Well, I mean, a former BJP leader in, I believe, Chhattisgarh articulated it the best, Dilip Singh Judeo. He said, Paisa khuda nahi hai, lekin khuda se kam bhi nahi hai. So as the BJP sort of, you know, reinvents its political funding uh, system, I mean, how much of a voice will the local RSS cadre on the ground have vis-a-vis -vis the decision making of the Bharatiya Janata Party is something which is extremely, I think, important and worth watching out for. And Professor Anderson also points out in his book that Narendra Modi, when he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat, he did not get along well at all with the local RSS BHP leadership. So I do not think that this was not a factor because we know Narendra Modi's politics. He is, you know, under his leadership, the party has had a reliance on this thing. Now, the contrarian view, of course, could be that if the RSS has adapted so far, why can it adapt, you know, even more? You know, why, what will prevent the RSS from sort of handling all these contradictions? Now, there are two things. One, I believe, is the RSS's basic organizational structure. You know, there are many times in the book where Professor Anderson mentions that the RSS will go to any extent to prevent a voting in its rank on issues which are divisive. Now, short pants or long pants could be a benign division of opinion, but as the BJP spends more and more time in power, as the RSS gets more and more sway over policy making in this country, I think there would be far more serious issues where division of opinion is bound to happen. And if the RSS cannot allow democratization of decision making, then there's going to be a serious problem. And I also think that, you know, Thinking that these contradictions will sort of make the RSS implode and go away is wishful thinking. You know, politics, you can't you know, wait for the apple to fall. So it is also the responsibility of the political forces who sort of say that they are you know, opposed to the idea of India which the RSS has and all that to sort of you know, work to sharpen these contradictions. So a lot of what happens to the RSS will also depend on how the opposition, and here I do not mean the political opposition to the BJP, but the entire social gamut of forces which you know, sort of claim to oppose the RSS, how they play out their politics, how they intervene in the days to come, intervene to sort of sharpen these contradictions vis-a-vis -vis the RSS. And I think, you know, the basic challenge for people who are against the RSS is, can we offer an alternative which instead of trying to negate Hindutva, and I'm deliberately not saying Hindu, but using Hindutva, you know, anybody who says Hindutva is bad, it is actually music to the RSS ears, I believe. The RSS gets a, you know, sort of opportunity to say that everybody who is basically anti-Hindutva is anti-Hindu also. And negate the RSS's objective of converting India into a Hindu Rashtra. Now, for all, you know, quote-unquote reforms, adaptations, the RSS is underground. I read the constitution of the RSS for the first time. It is given as an appendix in Professor Anderson's book. Nowhere, I mean, it describes some esoteric goals about Hindu Rashtra and Bharatvars and all that, but nowhere does it you know, talk about, say, the freedom struggle of the country. More importantly, nowhere does it talk about upholding the constitution of India. So I believe, you know, the ultimate project of the RSS is something which is completely inimical to what the republic as we know it stands today. And that is the main political battle which sort of underplay in the days to come. And I also think that this is why Gandhiji, who, by the way, was also extremely intellectually difficult to justify. I mean, no amount of intellectual justification can sort of explain Gandhiji's politics to us, is all the more relevant in Indian politics today. Thank you. And now let me turn to Dr. Abhinam Prakash, who is an assistant professor at uh, SRCC, Sri Ram College of Commerce, Delhi University. Abhinam. Uh, thank you, Professor Pant, for having me here. And it's an absolute honor to be sharing the stage with Professor Anderson. Uh, before I start talking about the book and the RSS in general, let me start with three quick examples. Now, I come from Delhi University, and the elections are approaching very fast. Last year, if you remember, in the Dusu election, 
ABVP lost two seats, the post of the president and the vice president. And all over the media, it, it, it was like a celebration, especially in the English media, that the liberal values have won and students have rejected the uh, politics of caste and regressive agenda. But what exactly happened was that if you, anyone who was in the Delhi University and was seeing it, there was unabashed caste celebration by the supporters of the candidates of the NSUI, both on the social media and both on the streets. They were not concerned with what the English media was painting as a victory of students and liberals and all those things. It was a caste victory, nothing else. Whereas the ABVP candidates who won, who were they? One was a woman, one was a girl. The other was a Dalit boy from the Eastern UP. Now, all of you who know, have some idea about the Delhi University politics, uh, will realize that it's almost impossible for anyone outside the Delhi Haryana belt to win the election. But that ABUP got a person from the Eastern UP and that to a Dalit boy, a member of uh, DUSU, that was huge. But it is the ABUP which ended up being branded as anti-woman, patriarchal, anti-Dalit and so on. What, what is happening is completely different from what the view we get in the media and the intellectual discourse. Second point, this is just before the 2014 election. I come from UP, I come from Fazabad. It was in 2013, November or December, I was at home. So there was this uncle, neighborhood uncle, who, was, who used to run this neo-Buddhist society and advocating people to convert to Buddhism and abandon Hinduism because Hinduism is bad and, you know, the standard Ambedkarite politics. It was in 2013, he, I heard him saying, was sitting in my home, drawing room, and saying that, well, Bhai Sahib, if Modi doesn't win, he was asked, asked, telling to my father, Hindus will be destroyed. Now, he's a person who's running a new Buddhist society, and he's 24-7 against Hinduism, but the consciousness remains. He says, if Modi doesn't win, the Hindus will be destroyed, so we must vote for Modi in the next election. Now, this suggests the appeal of the RSS and the Hindu agenda, which goes far beyond what can be gauged by looking at the normal newspapers and all. Third point, I also come from JNU. I come from the School of Social Sciences, which is the hub of the left-wing politics. Russian also comes from the same school. I had people after people from Dalit caste and OBC caste coming to me and saying, Bhaiya, we vote for ABVP when we, once we go inside the uh, polling booth, but outside we support SFI and ISA. Because if we don't support SFI and ISA, the left-wing professors will make sure that our career doesn't go anywhere. ABVP does not have the intellectual heft, does not have the people in the system to help us. So we simply go inside the booth, we vote ABVP, we come outside and we shout anti-ABVP slogans. Right? So what is happening in the India is completely different if you, uh, is completely different from the picture you get if you are only reading the intellectual work and the, uh, but the intellectual are basically mean the left wing intellectuals and the English newspaper. It is completely different dynamics at play out here. Now, uh, why, why do you have this kind of appeal? I will like to focus more on the subjective part of what Roshan said and what is the theme running throughout the book. Well, see, why did the Hindutva originate it? From where does it come from? Despite the claims by the RSS and even the BJP, Hindutva is a modern construct. It's a very modern, recent construct. It is not an ancient construct. It comes from the contradiction when the British started ruling India and you suddenly have the growth of capitalism and the capitalistic modernity that threw up lots of questions that, that basically split open the Indian society in various ways. And you also have the modern political constructs being imported from the Europe, most important being the concept of nation and nationalism. Now, the British question to Indians will always was, but you are not a nation. The India is not a nation. You are just an amalgamation of different castes and communities. You do not have any legitimacy to rule yourself. We British are going to rule you. It is the response to this thing that the Indians, and especially the Hindus, went around and try to find an answer. And Hindutva basically originates from here. Hindutva is important, whether you agree it or not, because it was the first systematic response to imperialism, a Hindu response to imperialism. Before that, India has been invaded and ruled by so many people, but there was no coherent Hindu response ever. It was the Savarkar who basically sat down and gave a response. It was a response to two things in the RSS and the Hindutva view. One was the response to the Western colonialism, 
we are answering you that we are a nation, we are a Hindu nation. And second, it was the response to the resurgence Islamic imperialism. Because, you know, when the British started uh, ruling India and the changes started happening in the society and economy, various ideological constructs emerged. One was obviously the Hindu nationalism. One variant of Hindu nationalism what, uh, is what you call Indian nationalism. Despite what Congress says about a secular nationalism, the theme of the Indian nationalism of the Congress was always rooted in the Hindu, Hindu uh, worldview. Second was what you call the Ambedkarite politics, this anti-caste movement. If you see the anti-caste movement, all the Dalit movements emerged in the areas which were directly the point of contact of the modern capitalist system, Western UP, Madras, Bengal. Other one was what you call in the South India, the Dravidian movement, and the fourth was the Pan-Islamism, which uh, basically extend beyond the Indian subcontinent. So, if, if you have to understand Hindutva and Hindu nationalism, you have to locate it in the context, where it is originating and why it is originating. If you're not honest about the origin itself, I mean, even if you want to counter RSS, you want to counter Hindutva, or you want to promote it, you just can't do that. And I think Professor Anderson has brought about these debates very well in the book when he's talking about what is Hindutva. There is really no consensus about what is Hindutva, even within the RSS family. Now, it originated, it grew, it did some work, but the approach uh, or the reach of the RSS was very limited. It was basically limited to certain pockets of the Western India and among the upper caste of the Hindi heartland. That's it. Its, uh, its reach was really not expanding. And as and Professor Anderson points out that it actually started growing after the economic reforms. Now, what is the dynamic of the economic reforms in India? Now, unlike the standard uh, view which go around that RSS and uh, uh, the uh, other social justice parties like SP and BSP are anti each other, I don't see them being anti each other. I think they both feed on each other. See, what is happening in India after independence? You have a reservation policy. You have the rebuilding of India. India is suddenly growing. I mean, if you compare that to the 200 years of the British rule, you have economic growth. And after 90s, suddenly you have a boom in the economy, which basically brought lots of non-upper caste people into the middle class fold. Before that, if you were to go around in India, the people living in the cities were mostly Savarna, upper Savarna Hindus. They were mostly upper caste. What is happening in India for the last 20, 30 years is that the demography in the cities and the urban centers is changing drastically. You suddenly have lots of Dalits and OBCs who are part of the urban societies living in the same flat, same society as their upper caste people. Now that has led to something very interesting. That has led to the convergence of the worldview and the lifestyle. Before that, you were living in the villages and you had upper caste uh, what you call in, at least North India's called Tola or the section of the village, you have the Dalits, you have the other caste. There was no interaction. There was no direct interaction between them. The boundaries were too rigid. Now, once they come to the cities, the boundaries are diluting and there's a convergence of the worldview. There's a convergence of the lifestyle. There's a conversion of the aspiration. And what do you have? I mean, the, the process which happened in the West in 100, 200 years is happening in India in just 50, 60 years, this economic growth. When economic growth happened, what happens? You are suddenly becoming mobile person. You are no longer rooted to the village. You are no longer rooted to your community. You are suddenly uprooted and you are moving around in the larger marketplace. Now you search for an identity. You search for uh, uh, an anchor to yourself. And that anchor has been increasingly provided by the Hinduism. Not Hindutva, but Hinduism as the religion. What has happened in India that despite the tall claims you see, uh, you, you see Jignesh Mewani, you see lots of people, you see that somehow Dalits are moving out of Hinduism. I'm sorry, exactly opposite is happening. The Hinduization, the mainstream Sanskritized Hinduization has happened at the, at the, has happened at the most fastest pace after independence. And that has to do a lot with the economic dynamics of the affairs. Now, despite this thing, the RSS had a very limited reach because of two reasons. One, RSS was dominated by the upper caste. If you go to the Bihar, no one wants to join RSS or BJP. There's a heavy resistance because it is completely dominated by the Jamindar caste. But that's not the case in every part of the country. Second, the language and symbolism which the Hindutva movement used 
was deeply rooted in the upper caste cultural milieu. So that was not able to, I mean, the other people were not able to connect to that. This was what was happening. Now, what is happening that last 20, 15 years, as you point out, the RSS is making a very, very determined effort to change that. Suddenly, you see their language is changing. It's slow, because this is RSS. This is not a revolutionary organization. They move in a, in a they basically try to strike a fine balance between the different communities. Now, see, RSS continues to be rooted in the upper caste. They are the one who are its main members. They are the one who will influence. RSS cannot antagonize them. We saw that in the recent case, in the case of reservation policy, in the case of SCST Act. Now the RSS and the BJP decided on the day one that they will reverse the Supreme Court judgment. But they, did, they said nothing, they kept, they kept silent. I mean, they kept quiet because they never wanted to antagonize the upper caste constituency. So they took their time, they did a fine balancing, they built consensus, then they came and reversed the Supreme Court judgment on the SCST Act. And same thing they are going to do in the case of the reservation issue in the universities. Now, this is something which is happening and which is going completely unnoticed, uh, which I find very strange because all of us live in this country, live in the society, we're seeing it every day. But somehow, as Roshan pointed out, that uh, the, especially the anti-RSS camp is simply unwilling to accept that lots of things have changed. They're still stuck to what Goldwalker said, what other people said. But the point is that the, the game is not finished yet. <coughs> game is not finished yet because RSS still has lots of, uh, uh, I will say, uh, grounds to cover. Number one, its relations with the Dalits remain very, very delicate. There's a movement of the Dalits toward the RSS like anything in the last six, seven years. I remember in 2014 elections when one of the anchor was uh, traveling in the Western UP and she was interviewing the, some Dalit boys in a village. And she said, whom will you vote in 2014? So those boys, those, those were Jatos, which are the core constituency of Mayavati. They said, Narendra Modi. So she said, why? Uh, you are Dalit, BJP is a Hindu party, why will you vote? Well, those say, we are also Hindus. I mean, those boys were amused at the question. They said, we are also Hindus. So she said, why? I mean, the, even if you are Hindu, the BJP is anti-Dalit, why will you vote for Narendra Modi? Well, the boy simply said that, well, we want Desh, Delhi mein Modi and Lucknow mein Mayawati. So there's a, com there's a continuous negotiation between the different political actors in the country and different social sections, which defy the binary people put that this is a RSS camp, this is the BSP camp, this is the SP camp. I mean, take for example, the Yadavs. The Yadavs who are basically counted upon by most of the liberals to counter BJP, well, they might be in political alliance with the Muslims for the electoral reasons, but simply, simply go and talk to a Yadav and say, can you marry your daughter or sister to a Muslim man? I mean, it will be a right, right? It's, just, it's not just happening. So these political calculations which are happening, political alliances, they do not exactly capture the simplistic analysis which listen, we listen in the uh, country. Now, you look at the Mayavati's politics, you look at the uh, Mandal politics, the OBC politics, they have a contradiction too. They have a contradiction that the very success of the Dalit politics, very success of the OBC assertion strengthens Hindutva. The success of Mayavati, the success of Kanshiram, the success of BSP, the success of Mandal politics in challenging the upper caste hegemony and has diluting the day-to-day -day caste atrocities actually led to a convergence between the lower caste and the upper caste. And it is that constituency, the new generation which is growing up, that is becoming the most vocal advocate of Hindutva. Because there are many long-term trends which are in action. It's not just about RSS doing everything. RSS is also riding on various trends which are happening without RSS. One is increasing Hinduization of the, uh, what you call the Dalits and the lower OBCs. Number two, the increasing urbanization and the new generation which is growing up. Number three, as he said, the technology, which is very important, the IT sector. Before that, you know, the avenues of information, the avenues of uh, public opinion were dominated by few people. As you pointed out, that Nehruan consensus, it was an elite consensus. How did Nehru win election? No one asked that. How did Congress rule the India for so long? What was the social structure of the uh, what was the social structure 
of the Congress rule. No one seems to be bothered about these things. Well, Congress was a party of elite urban Brahmins, that's it. It was a party of the elite urban educated Brahmins ruling in alliance with the local Jamindars or the dominant caste who ensured the victory in the elections. The Dalits and the lower OBCs were simply not allowed to vote. You go to UP up until the Kanshiram came up in the 80s and the 90s, the Dalits across the UP at least were not allowed to vote or they voted as they were told to. Now the point is that the point is that the moment the BSP started breaking down this thing and making sure that the lower castes also vote, now those people may go anywhere. I mean, once they started voting, they will vote Mayawati for two, three elections. Well, then they will cut a deal with the BJP. The BJP gives them more seats and more representation. They will move on to the BJP. This is a, this is a process which is least understood, that this very success of the Dalit and the OBC politics feeds Sindhu Hindutva. The icons and the narratives created by the Kanshi Ram in UP are now used by the RSS. All these heroes and the women heroes like Jalkari Bai, Uda Devi, Raja Suhail Dev, they were all created by the Kanshi Ram and the Dalit movement, not by the RSS. But all of them serve the perfect function of RSS trying to make inroads in these communities. Now, this is the thing which will go on, which is yet to be played out fully, but we can see this thing in the 2019, this, uh, this dynamics being played out. However, there are many challenges with the RSS face. One of them is obviously the, the relation with the Dalit politics. The other one is about as they grow in size, as they incorporate more forces, more actors, more castes, how are they going to manage the contradiction? It is very visible in UP these days, right? After the BJP has formed the government, suddenly the, all the upper caste in UP have started feeling that our Raj has come again. And that is basically pushing off lots of Dalits and the OBCs who voted uh, the uh, BJP in the election. Why that is happening? The top leadership has its own agenda of the BJP and RSS. They want to move beyond and they want to build a larger Hindu coalition. But the people you deal with on the ground do not have those objectives. So the people of the BJP and RSS who are coming from the village, who are the face of the organization on the ground, they might be just the uh, local caste uh, group, that's it. I mean, they're not bothered with the larger politics of Hindutva. These contradictions will play out. How do you try to, or how do you mediate between different castes? Because that is a very, very important point in India. The third point which will happen is that how does the RSS deals with the urban middle class? So far, urban middle class has supported them. The Hindutva has supported them. Uh, they have supported the Hindutva. But as you become more and more modern and urban, how do you deal with the new generation? That is something RSS has to figure out. As of now, the balance of power or tide seems in the favor of RSS. But as we know what happened in Bihar, as you mentioned in your book, and we also know what happened in the UP a couple of months back in uh, the protest in the Western UP, these things can unravel very quickly. It is very easy to build a coalition of Hindu castes, but very difficult to maintain it. Now that is something which RSS wants to do and wants to supersede, but that has to be seen as of yet. So I think this book is a very important contribution, sir, but this is a work in progress. There have to be many more books in the future by different authors, by different analysts, uh, by, by different scholars, who can actually capture this trajectory in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Abhinav, and maybe the next book uh, can be yours. Um, we, we, we will wait for that. Uh, but uh, with that, we, uh, we are running short of time. So I'll open this up quickly for your questions, comments, observations. This has been a very fascinating discussion so far. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, if you can introduce yourself very briefly and direct the question to whichever speaker you are. I'm Manju Kaak and I'm a volunteer with the All India Women's Conference. Um, I also come from Eastern UP. My narrative or my generation and understanding of the Congress, I'm afraid, is entirely different to yours. Some of your, uh, your arguments have, you know, hold some substance, but a lot of them seem to be factored by perhaps your education, your social upbringing, or your, your iconoclastic, uh, you know, life or family or whatever it is. Well, I much can of, say the same for you. Much, much of what you've said about the Congress is completely wrong. That's completely wrong. Completely wrong. It is a narrative fed post-1990s 
to a generation that has no understanding of the freedom movement in the sacrifices that people put in, which cut across all caste barriers. The tragedy today is people like you are pushing us back into those narrow paradigms. Ma'am, can you... Uh, He's making a comment on a yeah. book, so let's, let, let's not get personal. Yeah, I think but it's you, also a comment yes. on beliefs of people. Yes, but you are... You know, I mean, you we believe in certain things. Uh, I'll, 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 give certain you, I'll give you time. I'll give you for time. this country. Can, can I just respond to this thing? I, I'll, I'll come back to you, too, Abhinav. I just... Yes, sir. You have, the, you have a mic. Yeah. Yep. I just had a short question for Mr. Anderson and also for Mr. Prakash. That the, I think Mr. Prakash, uh, Dr. Prakash, I presume, laid out very nicely the fact the way the RSS is the prime mover, not just on the cultural front, but on a broader coalition, uh, a transformation of the idea of Hindutva. Now, my question is, where does that then leave the BJP? the way you laid it out seems a little redundant. I mean, just like a Mukota. It doesn't seem anything more than a Mukota, whereas most of the work, most of the political consciousness the, uh, at the field level, your vision is of the RSS mobilizing. But what's the BJP doing then? I mean, is, is this going to be a problem? Thank you for the presentations, all of you. I'm Varun Santosh. I'm researching electoral reforms currently, so I, I, I have a comment to you, sir, or rather question. Uh, I also want to expand on Roshan's comment on political funding. For the expansion of any organization, one important factor is the availability and access to financial resources. The comment you made on the growth of RSS along with liberalization is an extremely useful lens to look at the growth of Sant Parivar. It probably explains expansion of the Baniya community in the Brahmin Baniya nexus, and there may be many other such correlations to be made. I've only skimmed through the book, so please forgive me if I've missed anything. I wanted to ask you if you haven't explored deeply the relationship of RSS with business houses in India. And I found one passage in the conclusion very interesting about the complicated relationship of RSS somewhat puritanical ideology with BJP's politics especially quid pro quo on contracts for campaign donations and mass-based tainted leaders in the BJP. How will it reconcile ideology with practical challenges democracy? This is for the RSS. More importantly, can we be sure there are no quid, quid, quid pro quo donations to RSS itself, given their increased influence in policy making? What did you come across during the course of your research for this book on this particular topic? And if I may, just one more question. Uh, this relates to a comment uh, in Karan Thapar's recent book about PM Modi's candid comment to Mr. Thapar. This was before he became the CM of Gujarat. And this is regarding the mediocrity that ails the Sangh Parivar and his institution back in the early 2000s. Is mediocrity of the people and his institution that manned the Sangh Parivar still an issue? What do you think has changed since then? Thank you. I didn't get the question. Mediocrity. Uh, so M Modi made a comment to Karan Thapar, presumably, uh, in his recent book. Uh, I mean, this date, this comment dates back to the early 2000s that there is, mediocrity ails the Sangh Parivar and its institutions, and that is why it has not been able to, you know, uh, make a large influence on Indian society as much as it wants to be. Uh, that is Mr. Modi's assessment in early 2000s. What do you think has changed since then, and is it still an issue? Well, uh, I think the the lady has left because but I'm not surprised. But this is what the people on the left side do. I mean, they ask question, they never listen to the answer. Well, uh, I think. <laughs> I said that has. <laughs> okay, not you, sir. You are here to listen to the answer. This is, this is every, I'm hearing it 
almost every seminar, every function, and coming from a typical this quarter. Everyone says. Okay, so I take back my comment. I said this is the problem. Media is wrong. Everything. Can I? This is not an academic approach. Come on. Can I? Can I answer it, please? See, uh, I think the lady's understanding was completely wrong, and I think she was brought up to use her own argument in a very privileged elite family. She has no idea what is going around her. Uh, the Congress, I mean, she was talking about freedom struggle, but it is important to note that the Congress never took the, uh, the, the uh, issues of the Dalits up until the Pune Pact. This has to be noted very carefully. The Pune Pact was signed between what is often called the Gandhi Ambedkar Pact, but Gandhi never signed it. The pact was signed between the Ambedkar and what is called the Hindu right wing. It was the Savarkar, it was the right wing of the Congress who signed that pact. It was not the Gandhi who signed the Pune Pact. But anyway, since then, the Gandhi and the Congress started doing something for the Dalit issues in the urban areas. They never took up the cause of the Dalits in the villages. Because taking up the cause of the Dalits and the other lower EBC cost, a caste in the villages would have simply antagonized the peasantry and the, some of the few big landlords whom they were able to mobilize for the freedom struggle. So I think she, she doesn't have much idea what was going on, but anyways, this was her question. And after independence, you know, why did the BSP, why did the Mulayam Singh, why did the Lalu Yadav came up? They came up not to oppose BJP and RSS. They came up against the Congress. Well, Congress is continuing with the same hegemony of the upper caste, that's it. This was the single point agenda. If you read the uh, uh, speeches and the, uh, all the things of these leaders, it was anti-Congress on the caste line only, not much uh, around that. Now, this is what I was trying to make, but I think uh, it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes are too small to make a comprehensive argument, but thank you. You know the art. Now, but, but frankly speaking, I don't know because I mean, you have to follow the BJP RSS closely. I mean, the reporters who sort of follow these parties would know better. But I, I, I would like to make two short points. One, knife would not be out unless there's a major electoral upset to the BJP. As long as they are winning, people will. You know, buy peace with each other, which is why you know probably if the BJP does badly in the Madhya Pradesh elections, Rajasthan if they lose, I don't think will be a big deal because it has the state has a history of alternating between the BJP and the Congress. But in the next set of assembly elections, if the BJP loses Madhya Pradesh, you could see some of this you know, contradictions playing out. But I would also like to add what I said earlier that today for the RSS, the BJP being in power is not just a question of you know, spreading its ideology. It has also become crucial for its survival. I don't know if you noticed it, but this investigation about the Sanatan Sanstha, the Gauri Lankesh, Kalburgi murders have been going on. The Mumbai ATS arrested some people. Now, I don't know whether they are the RSS or not, but they are a radical Hindu organization apparently. And you should have seen the kind of mass mobilization which was done in cities in the favor of these people. So you are also talking about a politically potent ideology which is you know, willing to sort of openly come out in defense of radical Hindutva and violence if it entails. So these, you know, the, the RSS BJP thing is not going to implode. I mean, people will have to put some external contradiction to sort of make it happen. I, I, I appreciate everything that's been said. I really sort of, I learned a lot from some of these comments as well. About uh, Modi and the RSS, where is the locale of power? That's a critical question, I think, in all of this. I'm still trying to sort of work that out in my mind, but I think there's some new ingredients that have to be added. Is when, when people talk about the RSS, they often talk about the RSS as a discrete institution without the affiliates. Increasingly, that is an incorrect view. In many ways, the tail is wagging the dog. The, the various affiliates being in that mic, you know, that metaphor being the tail, and 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 the RSS itself being the dog. In terms of you know uh, politics uh, and the RSS, one only has to, a close reading of RSS documents up to about 1980, just at the time we were doing the first book. Very negative. Uh, that that change came from below. It came through the Shaka system. Uh, and, and not through kind of lobbying politics. Politics was dirty. In fact, there was a strong feeling in the RSS from the 50s when it reluctantly supported Shyam Prasad Mukherjee and the formation of the BJP. Oh, this was a, a dirty occupation. 
that you know what we're doing is much more noble, much more with a with a, a greater impact uh, in character building. Character building is it, it, it's uh, one. It's very Brahmanical. As you know, as you perfect yourself so that you can later perfect society. And that had been Golwalker's commitment. And it was only under Deo Ross it began to change, but you still had that flowing in it. It's only in the 80s you begin to get a change that politics maybe is something that has positive results. And it was the affiliates driving that. The Bharatiya Mazdur Sangh had a certain view of what should be done, but it can't do it without the government. The Bharatiya Kisan Sung had a view of what should happen in rural India, but that can't happen without the government. The government of India is so pervasive. And in fact, I don't see Modi really cutting back on the government. There are libertarians in the Sung Parivar or supporters. I can think of Tavleen Singh here, who wrote a whole article that she was so disappointed in the government that came to power because as a libertarian, she hoped that the government would get smaller. Quite the contrary. It's as big as it ever was. In fact, in some senses, it's bigger. And one thing is, uh, is the health scheme. This is going to be an enormous scheme of introducing government controls all over the country in tiny areas. It may also help the BJP as a consequence of this. Then you have the gas cylinder scheme, another one that's going to be have enormous consequence. I really don't see the government cutting back very much um, on these programs. And then you get into the other ideological issue that, that Modi run, ran on in 2014 is, is, we don't want handouts, we want jobs. Well, I see now something both happening, both handouts and the thing of jobs as, as a thing. I don't know which is going to be bigger. My guess is the handouts part of it may be uh, a, a rather big part of all of this as well. So, you know, it gets to the question of raising money. You know, where, where do you raise money? It's often, I think, overlooked that the RSS money is, comes through Guru Dakshina. It's a celebration that they had. And, and, and I am told that most, if not most, uh, much of it is sort of given anonymously to the RSS. But where is the money being spent? Most of the money is not being spent on the RSS. In fact, in many ways, it's a very frugal institution. Most of the money is being spent by the various affiliates. And they raise their own money. Nobody that I know has looked at that. Nobody has looked at where these affiliates raise their money. In fact, we even didn't because it sort of came to us late, it dawned on us. We have it in some sense wrong. It's not the RSS that's raising most of the funds. It's the various affiliates that are raising. We did, if we'd had another six months, or Penguin wouldn't give us another six months, you know, we may have gone into the question of where do they get the money? Maybe you can do something on that. You know, where do they get the money? Because that's where the real money is. In fact, one looks at the Sung family these days, I think you increasingly have to look at the affiliates. It's there you have the politicization of, of the RSS. We have a whole chapter on that, is how is the RSS become increasingly involved in the policy process? It's through the affiliates. And they have moved away from this kind of negative view of politics as to something, like a lobby group, as to something that can actually achieve some positive things in society. Is there some resistance among the old timers? Yes. Uh, I, I wanted to, something that kept in my mind, I wanted to sort of make mention of this about the problem I think you brought up of the RSS ideology and the real society. You know the name Taran Vijay, former editor of Twantijanya and organizer. He led a group, he brought a group of Dalits into a temple. He, he, he is, if you know him and I know him very, he's a true believer. We need an equalitarian society and an egalitarian society, which is the, the message of the arts. This is what we need, and we have to live it. Uh, I'm reminded of many Christians who cut, well, we must live, but you know, in real life, it's one day a week, and the rest we do our own thing. He lives it. Really, this is a young man who lives it. What happened? He was bashed up by people in the area. And who saved him? And he says this. It was a Muslim who actually rescued him from a crowd that was going to bash him up. I was hoping that, uh, I must admit, I, I'm disappointed in India. I did not see any kind of public outcry from anybody, to be quite frank. I know the prime minister visited him, but I didn't see an out. Now, why, why didn't other India, why didn't the left come up and say something? Why didn't the right come up? Nobody in this country made a point, and it was publicized. It's not as if this was an event that nobody knew about. People knew about it. Why didn't everyone say, I'm Taran Vijay? Everyone, I'm Taran Vijay. 
that, but that didn't happen. And it probably could relate to the point you were making, is that on the ground, views can be very different from ideology or at the top. In fact, I'll make a point about this. I, I quote a New, York, uh, New Yorker article, very good article about some election, in which it wasn't the ideology, but it was the various elements of what the party was able to bring together, kind of candidates, that sort of thing, that spelled the victory. We often overplay ideology as a driver in elections and in motivation. And the Tarn the J case is an excellent case of that, where nobody spoke out. Did you speak out? Uh, no, I have to, have to ask another question. Who's? Did you speak out? Can I? Can I just? Yeah, we have a number of hands up, so I want to give everyone a chance. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Harsh Gupta. Uh, if you can be very concise, because I'll be, we're running I'll be very quick. Uh, so I just noted a couple of uh, different comments, not necessarily contradictory. So. Professor Anderson said, I don't know why at some point there were all these communist affiliates and now suddenly there are these RSS affiliates all over the, what is this meta trend perhaps? And then I think Roshan said that, uh, you know, we won the, we as in the center left won the argument in JNU and in JNK, but the political victory went to the right. So I'm not saying they're necessarily contradictory, but perhaps there is a possibility that even the intellectual victory, so to speak, went to the right in those two Cases. I mean, for example, the way Abhinav said, you know, castes, they rise up and then it becomes part of the larger Hindutva project. So is it the case that economic mobility, inter-caste marriages, um, all kinds of urbanization is leading to an under, is leading to an intellectual and actualization of the Hindu Rashtra? I mean, Perry Anderson said, AFSPA starts where Hindu majority stops. So maybe that is a reality that the left in India is just not accepting. There's a seat here. There's an empty seat right here. I'm just, I'm just curious about one thing. You know, uh, at one point you said people talk when they're talking about BJP, they are like more forthcoming, but not about the RSS. That's one point. The next point you, you've been uh, you know, talking about how the affiliates how they like the talk. Uh, is it because of your access uh, to information that you know that's really coming from the affiliates, not so much from the RSS, that you think the affiliates are actually playing a larger role or more powerful? Uh, I was just curious. And, and one more point about uh, the affiliates. I mean, the other point, generally, like the legendary BMS uh, founder, I mean, he has openly attacked Vajpayee. And I mean, from your last book till this book, I mean, in between, a lot has happened. Uh, are we looking at some gaps here of understanding? I'll just speak. Yeah, uh, thank, thank, thanks to all the three speakers. Uh, I, my name is Anand. I'm a researcher at uh, working on China, so this is completely unrelated. But my interest is, I'm just looking at what Roshan was just saying, that the RSS is for them in survival, so that's why the BJP uh, government uh, presence is important. But isn't it both ways? I mean, because if you look at Prashant Jha's book itself, where he talks about how RSS works on its own, on its way, and it sort of, I mean, how silently the organization works and that benefits for the BJP. So even BJP social engineering, do you think it will act upon, or the electoral compulsions will act upon as a force of change within the RSS? For example, just to look at the leadership, I mean, the entire RSS sunset talents have all been Brahmins, and mostly. But most of the, and not just Brahms, but also Maharashtra Brahms. So, can that, the electoral compulsions of the political wing of the RSS, that, can that act upon the RSS in terms of so my uh, uh, question was based on uh, what Professor Anderson <laughs> said that uh, maybe the women are not finding enough participation and significance. But lately, I have seen there's a lot of uh, women empowerment. There's a NSG group. There are armed filers. They are allowed to participate in um, you know in armed forces. There is wrestling. There's women boxing. There is a Actually, so there's all-round encouragement of women to 
come up and take up roles which were not traditional. And uh, the party in power for the last four years has been a, has been a B BJP RSS alliance. So is there a contradiction or, uh, you know, between what you said? And isn't it the left's prerogative to probably humanize Savarkar and Golwalkar and so that we can have an informed debate on both sides. So that, you know, as uh, Avinav sir said, that the elitist India can uh, have a debate, uh, a simultaneous debate and talk face to face to the India on ground. I, I missed what, did you say demonization? Uh, demonization of, 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 of Savarkar uh, and Savarkar humanization and, right, okay. and their rehumanization. Okay. World War I, uh, Tool Society of Germany. That was the, uh, from there, uh, the Nationalist Social uh, uh, Workers Party came into being, and we know Nazi. Are you talking about the Turnverein? Yeah, Eckhart, Mr. Gem, Eckhart. The, gem, the gems, yeah. yeah. So uh, now I see a lot of similarity, especially when uh, Abhinav mentioned 2000 years of uh, non Hindu rule and. Uh, Russian. 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 Sorry. And uh, from there, uh, uh, the, the need for nationalism and nationality and that identity which the Brits used to always uh, tell the Indians that you, you're not a nation. And from there, uh, there was the, uh, the championing of the cause by the Hindus mm. and the upper caste and all that. So is there a similarity? Because is RSS akin to the same kind of uh, ideology and, and from there, you know, drawing uh, of the... Uh, because. I see a lot of similarities, you know, the far right wing uh, in Germany post World War One, and from there the uh, coming into being of the Nazis. My question is about the Dr. Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson, I've been looking at the etymology of the uh, word saffron and saffronization, the neurological. Your uh, book, Titan 88, uh, The Saffron Brotherhood, I just wanted to know. How common was this term saffron and saffronization at the time when you wrote that book? Uh, because right now it is everywhere, the term saffron and saffronization. And do you still hold with the term saffron or saffronization? Because a lot of uh, hardliners, the right wing Hindus, also want to detach themselves from saffronization because traditionally the word saffron is associated with the Hindu ascetic. And not for like any kind of violence or right-wing ideology. Can I quickly answer that before I forget my answer to it? Uh, yes, I, we take full credit for the popularization of the term saffron. It had not been popular before. So if anybody wants to sort of give credit to where it's due, just, it's us. Yes. Uh, that it, it was, was an answer he wanted to give. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was not very popular before. And when we got the title, it was almost like, you know, pitching pennies. We had several in mind. And uh, my wife intervened. She had heard us, and she said, I think the Brotherhood of the Saffron is a great topic. And it turned to be one of the best things of the book was its title. <laughs> so I think uh, we have two last uh, comments and questions, and, uh, and I think I would end I should say, I, I don't particularly, well, I shouldn't say this too loud. I think this title is not nearly as good <laughs> as that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Anderson, you said uh, about uh, Mr. Modi, that he belongs to the OBC. He started belonging to OBC after 2002 only. Before 2002, up to 2001, he belongs to a community, Mod Gachi. Mod in Gujarati is, a poros, is used as a for prosperity. Mm. And Gachi was his, his sub-caste. In Banyas, Gachi, uh, Gachi community used to be a prosperous community, but at the lower rung of the Baniya community, like Agarwal, Bansal, Kansal, etc., so on and so forth. 
When Mr. Modi became the Chief Minister of Gujarat in 2001, so in 2002, Gujarat government issued a circular putting Mod Gachi in a OBC community, OBC caste. Mr. Modi, to me, I, my personal views, very smart. He was knowing that in RSS, he belongs to RSS. In RSS, there are many very senior people in RSS. So he will not have much say in as far as if he belong, continue belongs to the upper com community because RSS is still being ruled by upper caste people right now also. So he very smartly converted his community into OBC to get a support outside RSS. So that, 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 that perhaps may have paid the dividend, dividend to, to have a, to have a, uh, inroads into the uh, OBC community also. What is your views? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the great talk. Um, three quick questions. I don't want to go into details. First of all, I'm from Bengal, where we have an ideological opposition to what the RSS might pose. So when it when the caste Are barrier... All, all, all Bengalis have... <laughs> you surely, you surely don't mean that. Appropriating the idea. Yeah. But... I'm, I'm just saying that in Bengal politics, when caste divisions give way to class divisions, does the RSS ideology not work in that context anymore as it does in other states? Secondly, what is the difference between RSS's approach to the Vajpayee government and why wasn't the Hindu Rashtra in 1998 when we had a BJP government in power and why is it in 2014? And thirdly, if the idea of Hinduism is, is actually being publicized what the RSS says and by Hindutva, is the ideological opposition only possible from within the Hindu religion and not outside of it? Because at this point in time, the kids who are growing up in this generation, for them, Hinduism and Hinduitva, the lines are blurring very slowly. So how is that going to play out in the future? That's all. Thank you. On, on the Tarun Vijay thing, a lot of progressive voices Think of it as a version of the white man's burden being held by the, you know, upper caste Hindu man's burden, and that's and that's the approach that many progress, progressive voices think that the RSS itself takes towards Dalits into some to some extent, and that criticism is valid for also the centrist forces and a lot of uh, you know, and there is a lot of hypocrisy among the progressive voices as well. Just wanted to highlight that. Mm. Well, I think I missed your question that time about the uh, what the BJP is doing. Well, but my no, I was not feeling angry. <laughs> See, it, it happens, right? Wherever I speak, whether it's the right wing gathering, left wing gathering, upper caste gathering, Dalit gathering, someone gets provoked. Right. So I, I think that's a success of what I speak. Uh, the the I missed your point exactly your question about about the BJP. I think you were asking that I'm trying to portray the RSS as the prime mover. Well, I'm tr not trying to do that. I'm seeing the long term trends. I mean, this is what the sir has done in the book. I'm seeing the long term trends which are also pushing RSS. RSS is riding those long term trends which go beyond the conventional binary understanding of what we have. Now, this gentleman said that the Bengal does not have caste. Nothing is, uh, I mean, a bigger lie than that. Caste-based politics is not there. That is not there. That is wrong because if you look at the before the independence, uh, there were lots of Dalit movements in Bengal. And the, the Dalits and the other uh, lower caste were a political force. I mean, Mandel was there. Even under the Congress rule, they were a powerful force. It is the 35 years of the communist rule which has completely destroyed them and pushed away from the, uh, what you say, the public space that you are able to say there is no caste politics in Bengal. Right? So that is the point. So there are 23% Dalits in Bengal, I think 10 or something percent tribals. And uh, mark my word, BJP is going to ride on them in the next election. You can't stop that. I don't think Mamta Banerjee can stop that. The, uh, this is what they're doing. Uh, and coming to another point someone said about, I'm sorry, Harsh apparently asked about something. What was that? Can you just? So basically, uh, it's the intellectual argument also for the right because of what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, in, 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 right. in, in the JNU case, it is very interesting. I mean, uh, I, I think the left won the debate on the TV screens. That's it. On what? On the TV screens. The left won the debate. The, the, <laughs> the, the left just won the debates 
on the on the TV screen. I mean, doesn't doesn't matter. I mean, the the entire gain of the JNU incident went to the BJP and RSS in the countryside. Even the kinds of leaders which threw up. I mean, I'm not take names of the people, but all these youth leader which go around their lit fest. I mean, talk to anyone. No one takes them seriously because all of them are elite upper caste. I mean, you talk even to the Bapsa and other uh, Dalit politics, OBC uh, parties within the JNU, they simply say, we are not going to listen to this Kanhya Kumar and all who are there to speak. So you didn't want the debate, right? The debate went to the BJP and RSS. Even the people who are uh, doing OBC politics and the Dalit politics, they come and say, well, we are not uh, going to tolerate the destruction of the Republic of India because of Nivita Menon or someone says Kashmir Kazadi, because this is the only state ever in the subcontinent, which has done something for us. It is the Republic of India is the only st state, political entity, which has some, done something for the people who are on the margins of the society. So they don't agree with this radical left agenda. Who agrees, I don't know. I mean, you talk to the people across the uh, country, no one will agree to that agenda. I mean, you simply say that saying socialist rhetoric and speaking against the Modi gives you a certain kind of fan following. Well, that's OK, but that is not willing the political debate. Thank you. First was the, I think, how the left should deal with Savarkar, Govarkar, all these things. Two quick comments. One, I believe a lot of you know, problems of you know, the left of center political spectrum not being able to deal with these things is also from the lack of organic contact is had vis-a-vis -vis the masses. Now you honestly tell me which communist party leader in this country has you know, any organic contact left with the people. Take out Kerala for example and all these people who sit here and you know, claim to be communist leaders. I think they have absolutely no idea what is going on in most parts of this country. The second thing is, you know, this is an interesting and a more academic thing. You know, how do you evaluate people, you know, political figures? I think their evaluations in the present or, you know, distant, not so distant past and their long-term evaluations are bound to differ. I can say with a lot of confidence that Baba Sahib Ambedkar been alive today, he would have been the most hated politician in this country. You go and read his writings, he has basically taken panga with everybody. And, and we today, we, you know, he's probably the most revered political figure in this country across the political spectrum. There's not one political party. In the, I don't know about the Maoists, but there's not one political party in this country which will say bad things about Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Can't afford to. Yeah. Without, exactly, yes. Can't afford to. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you there. Yeah. So that is where it's more complicated. Unless you have politics going on the ground, it's very difficult to deal with the RSS. The other thing... You know, where you said, you know, JNU and all these things. You see, there are two things. When I said, you know, you know even if it loses, loses the intellectual argument, it could win the political things. There are two things. One, I think you can rightfully accuse the left of oversight. You know, both their academic methods and their political methods. There are a lot of degeneration set in. We can have a separate conversation on it. Where I think I say the intellectual method does not matter for the RSS is the RSS doesn't have a scientific scheme for its things. So the Soviet Union, it collapsed. No, it went into horrible things. But ultimately, it has a scientific basis to the entire argument. That collapsed. That is not the case with the RSS. It primarily draws its legitimacy from majoritarian religion, you know, religious identity. There are many successful organizations in the world like that. RSS is not the only one. As far as the JNU thing is concerned, JNU... It is not just the intellectual argument which JNU has won. So, I mean, actually, you know, before the Kanaya thing happened, the ABP actually managed to win a seat in JNU, which was a big deal because they won it, uh, you know, after, uh, I believe, 2000. Uh, 2000 May, the ABP for the first time had a central panel seat where Sandeep Mahapatra became the president. The ABP actually lost that seat after they arrested Kanaya. One minute, I'll speak and then you say. Then the next year, I mean, JNU, you know, from for the outside world is a leftist den, but the left has infinite contradictions in JNU. Then everybody on the left actually united in JNU. You know, that, you know, the RSS, so that way it's a unifying factor. But JNU at the end of the day, it's one of the most elite universities in this country. You know, you could be a Dalit, you could be an upper caste, you could be, you know, living in Aurangzeb Road, you could come from Chapra in Bihar. People who are studying in JNU are getting the most privileged, subsidized, best quality education even today in this country. I don't know what will happen five years later if the <laughs> vice chancellor continues. But that is where I'm saying that the level intellectual consciousness, political consciousness of the country is not at the same page with JNU. And in politics, you can't you know, do the Bartol Brecht line that let us change the people because we do not, we have lost faith in the people. That is what the left is trying to do. That is where I said you cannot pick in, intellectually castigate the RSS and then blame that people don't understand us. That was my limited point. And Bengal, you know, I think caste is extremely important in Bengal even today. You know, the Namshudras played a big role in Mamta Banerjee's victory. 
and this entire thing that consciousness and all that you know uh, uh, class sort of overcame everything is completely false there's a mass exodus from the cpim today happening to the bjp you just look at vote shares from 2014 onwards 2014 2016 by polls it is now a trinamool versus bjp match so caste has probably you know gotten submerged in the bay of bengal i don't think there's any class left in you know, west bengal right <laughs> Can I just quickly point out to what Roshan said? Well, you are right that all the left parties united and made sure that ABUP doesn't win. But the very fact that they united to make sure ABUP doesn't win JNU tells you something. The vote share of ABUP has gone up substantially in JNU, and ABUP is counting on this that the left alliance cannot continue forever. How long will ISA and SFI will be together? And they're saying we're building our long-term base. The moment their alliance breaks apart, we will win JNU. Thank you. I was hoping to go for another hour because I, I, I'm learning a lot from all of this. This is one of the best discussions I've sat in in the last couple of weeks as I've tried to sort of advertise my book, you know, and we're making changes in it. Uh, just a, a few things um, um, about the caste issue, which is, of course, uh, you know, a critical issue in many ways in India. In some ways, caste consciousness is growing, not diminishing. People who have studied democratic politics you know, argue that one of the things that democratic politics does is it tends to focus candidates on identity issues like caste. Look at India's constitution. It has built into it uh, affirmative action based on caste. Is that going to change anytime soon? No. Um, and look at the, uh, the civil code legislation based on caste. And there's a whole range of other things. Where is the movement to get rid of this? They don't exist because the people who are now the beneficiaries don't want them those benef benefits to go away. I'm often, you know, ha have the communist parties argued against these benefits? I, I don't recall a strong argument that these benefits are against the reservations. Against the reservations. Oh, I think uh, they missed the bus, but mm. now they, they can't. Yeah. Uh, well, they yeah. were not the first ones to raise the issue of caste, so they missed the bus on this completely. Uh, but I don't see any major movement to change it. Uh, the head of the RSS made a statement in Bihar where he said, maybe we should review it. And there was an explosion uh, against him. He had to quickly come back and say, I didn't really mean it. Da, 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 da. But what he was getting at, because I asked him this question, he said, I wasn't against reservation as such, but I was against the idea it's the creamy layer in groups. Who are the beneficiaries? Are they the really poor? No, they're not. And there have been many studies on this. They're the very tiny element of those who have both the education and the money and the access to get it. And I, th I think you know, a really good study of that, you know, statistical study should be done as to who gets the benefit. Uh, is he right? A lot of people tell me that he's right, that the beneficiaries are actually a very slim majority, the, the creamy layer at, uh, at the top. About, let's see, uh, the issue of... Um, you know, the RS, the, the communists, you know, lost lost touch with people. Maybe that's a good explanation as to why their vast range of affiliates collapsed as well. That is something the RSS still has. It has a phenomenal information gathering system. I'll give an example of this where there was a dilemma that came up. You're right. Somebody said that Modi was not all that popular with the RSS types in Gujarat. That's true, because he didn't fit the collegial you know, um, image that they wanted. The Vishwa Hindu Parishad even worked against him in one of the elections, and, and the Bharatiya Kisan uh, Sangh did as well. Uh, because what, what, Mo, what Modi did is, for infrastructure purposes, he removed temples. That was a no-no for the Vishwa Hindu Parishad. And for the Kisan uh, Sangh, it was he began to uh, build canals and infrastructure on roads and simply took, took land to build infrastructure for the larger good, and they opposed him. Uh, for for doing that. The RSS in 2013, it may have been 2012, you know, word went out, what do you think of Modi? Because there was uh, factions inside the BJP, and many of the factions were dead set against Modi, including within the RSS. Word came back that the average Svayam Sevik was overwhelmingly in favor of Modi. This was not the leadership institutional sentiment in the RSS. And it was something of a shock to find out how much the common Svayam Sevik felt that Modi had been unfairly treated, a witch hunt was against him, 
uh, that he had the makings of, of being a, um, a prime minister who could win the country. There had to be a certain pullback on the part of the leadership, and not all the leadership, you know, was enthusiastic. You know, there was, you know, widely believed that Mr. Advani didn't like that at all. And it was up to, and he wasn't the only one, and it was up to Mohan Bhagwat, you know, this idea of mediating, he had to kind of mediate to make sure that everybody stayed on board. And it worked in this case, so the mediation. Now, anyone who knows the functioning of the RSS can see why this information gathering system they have in the Indian context is, uh, you know, is really rare. It's, it's unique almost. Their leadership of about 30 are constantly on the move. They meet periodically, as you, you may know, they meet periodically to m map out where they're going. And they're constantly on the move, which is why some, and you have to be very healthy to do this sort of thing in India. You know, you have to go in 120 degree heat and live a very simple lifestyle. If you're not healthy, that can be a major problem. Why Baiji Joshi was reselected, he's not a healthy man, but he's got to travel a lot in the country. So, and, and so they get, they get to pick up information and, and the various shakas then give them information about what's, and, and the information came is, this man is overwhelmingly in, um, you know, uh, favorable to the Svayam Saviks. That, you know, so, and then the RSS changed. It, you know, officially changed. Okay, information came in, and they felt that they, they had to change, because to do anything else would have created a real problem for them on an important issue like this. So, my voice is running out, uh, so. so that, that's, that's a time when we say goodbye, and thank you, Walter, and. Yeah, oh, sources of what? I, was, I missed the question. Sorry, what was this? Sources are from more and, and yeah. um, actually, I, I did both. I did both. I had I had actually fairly good uh, on both sides. Um, where it was best, it's hard to tell uh, because there's some overlap between membership. Um, but I would say it was it was pretty good on on both. Um, I, there was one exception. I won't go into that now because you can probably imagine what that was. It was not the RSS. It was another group. Uh, but by and large, it was it was 